All right, thank you. My name is Steve Burt. I'm a first year student at MIT Sloan, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. You're at the in-game Genius or Gimmick Innovations panel. I'd like to introduce our guests for you this morning. We have George Carl from ESPN, Kevin Kelly from Pulaski Academy, Nate Silver from ESPN, Bill James from the Boston Red Sox, and Daryl Morey from the Houston Rockets. This panel will last until 10 o'clock, and we will leave the last 15 minutes for Q&A. To submit your questions, please text 22333 with the keyword in game, one word, or alternatively, you can tweet at polls using the same keyword in game, and then we will receive your questions. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin, who will start the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, this panel is called In Game Innovations Genius or Gimmick. Um, true story. I was in Houston a few years ago for a game. And uh, the Rockets are trailing at halftime to a team they shouldn't be trailing to. And I run into Daryl in the tunnel. And he's not happy. And he's like, I can't believe we're losing. They're so gimmicky. Um, so with that, let's, um, <laughs> Bill James said something interesting at the first Sloan Conference in 2007. You said that the next wave of analytics would be actually improving the games themselves, the way they're designed. So my question is, how are we doing? It's a slow process. The, uh, I think sports do not rush to adapt to innovations and should not. But I do think that there's more work being done about how the games could be better and that it's more of a mainstream uh, discussion than it was seven years ago. Daryl, MBA? Well, I'd say, uh, you know, in basketball, we have more of a tradition of tinkering. And I think uh, Commissioner Silver is, you know, very forward thinking and is already reaching out to people in basketball and saying, what, <laughs> what changes can we make? What, you know, shorter, shorter overtimes, different ways. Uh, the ends of our games are, I think, really tough sometimes. Foul, timeout, foul, timeout. Um, so those are, that's something I think is, is coming. We have a history of it, adding the three-point line. I think that's coming uh, in, in basketball even more. Uh, Kevin, since the forward pass, how's football doing? <laughs> I think that uh, we're probably the, the slowest sport to adapt to, to analytics and bring that in. And I'm not sure exactly why. Sometimes I think we're even stepping backwards. But it is more in the mainstream conversation, like, like Bill said. Nate? Yeah, so for, uh, for the ESPN analytics issue, I looked at the three largest sports, not to exclude hockey or soccer. Um, but the progress is pretty apparent in baseball. You know, almost all the teams are analytics friendly. Some implement them in better ways than others. Um, in the NBA, NBA, there's more arbitrage potentially, but look at the number of corner threes, which has increased by like 250% in the past 10 years or so. Um, but football, the number of uh, teams that are going for it on fourth down, that hasn't increased at all in in 20 or 25 years. In the NFL, I would say. Um, you know, I think you potentially see more innovation at the college level, um, at the high school level. My view on this is that the NFL is so profitable that there's not much incentive to innovate. I mean, to greatly oversimplify Moneyball, but it was a story of financial constraint. We saw when we had the regular recession a couple of years ago that some MLB teams finally figured out we shouldn't give long-term contracts to pitchers. This is a pretty bad idea. You know, now you see more inflation in the market again. Um, but you have you know, very old franchises that have been owned by the same family for decades in the NFL. It's not a culture that promotes innovation. It's a tremendous consumer product. So you know, you're financially secure even if you're the Jacksonville Jaguars or something like that. Um, but football, I think, certainly lags behind. Um, George, my new boss, Henry Abbott, has required that I mention Hoop Idea. Um, which is the project at ESPN where we're kind of discussing potential rule changes. You've been around long enough to have seen, you know, three to make two go by the wayside, various other rule changes. Is the game design right now uh, the way it should be? Uh, I have trouble with um, drastic rule changes. You know, the thought of, of a couple days ago about a four-point play. Uh, but actually, I read the book Naismith, uh, about, a month, about six months ago, and in, in his first evaluation of the game after, I think, about 10 years, is he thought about adding that the further away from the basket should be worth more, more points. 
I think from a coaching standpoint, we like you to give us the rules and then we'll try to break them. We'll try to fix them to where they make us work and be better. Um, you know, the game, I, the game is, I think basketball is the, one of the most athletic games. And as much as we enhance that, I think the NBA has done a good job of taking the hands off of the players. And now we have a, a very athletic game instead of a wrestling match that was maybe in the 90s and the 80s was more like a wrestling match. But I think coaches are, tr are, 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 are trained and stimulated by give us the rules and we'll try to make them work for us with the talent that we have. Uh, there's a great quote from your book, Nate, about innovation, um, the signal and noise. And uh, I'm trying to come up with a working definition. I've been talking with people all week. What's a gimmick and what's genius? Can a gimmick be genius? Is every ingenious thing a gimmick? And you know, one of the things you say is um, in your, uh, your thing is that, and I'm paraphrasing here because I've lost the quote, but okay. that it's one thing to come up with an idea that nobody else has thought of. It's another thing to make that idea good. Is that how we can delineate? Well, that's kind of what, what the free market sort of takes care of, right? Where um, you have a lot of people who are trying to bend and break the rules and exploit them in different ways, and you have some type of of competition. Um, and the good thing about sports, and I know people here will say, well, sports is really slow to adapt. You know, I think it's, it's light years ahead of, of politics, for example. Um, you know, the thing about politics is that you only have one election every four years, so you can be full of shit for a long time before you have a correction, right? Um, in sports, you know, there's certainly a lot of luck involved, more in some sports than others, but you're playing games every day, testing ideas every day. If you see fields where analytics have made the most difference, including things like weather forecasting, for example, weather forecasts are now pretty good. That wasn't true 20 or 30 years ago. It's because you get feedback on a continual basis. Um, that's nothing about the NFL, by the way, is only 16 games per year. You might feel like, I don't have as much time to experiment. Maybe it's mathematically correct to go for it on fourth down here to kick an onside kick. But if I'm wrong, I have to live with that for a week, right? In baseball, basketball, you get up and play the next day. Maybe that helps foster more innovation in game. And, and to go along a little bit with what he said and to tap into what George said, you know, there's two kinds of coaches, I think, that go in. There's those coaches that want to push the rules, as George said, and I think there's those innovative coaches that, that change their game and adapt their game that give them quote unquote advantages within those rules without pushing the rules. The fast pace offense that's talked about right now. And then and that's a great example because you've got those teams like Oregon and Auburn that played really fast and then you've got coaches that right now want to change that rule. So there's coaches that push the rules, bend the rules, get their players in basketball to maybe do this or that. And then there's those guys that want to stay with, completely within the rules but adapt their game. And I don't know, gimmick innovation, like we like to use fourth downs, we like to onside kick those things. I don't know that that's, a, that's an idea per se, but sit there and taking something, looking at it, looking at the numbers and doing something. I don't understand why profitability would make it such that teams in the NFL don't go for a more on fourth down. I mean, the data is, you know, obviously Kevin takes it to the stream and always goes on fourth down. That's probably not the right answer, but... Uh, the data is overwhelming that they should do it more, yeah. right? And the fact that they're not, the coaches, and, and George might be able to speak of this, the coaches are still competing and trying to win. So to me, all you need is like one pioneering coach in the NFL who starts winning using this and shows that it's better. Uh, George was probably one of the leaders in the corner three and how he set up his offense uh, to optimize that, among other things. And, you know, now you see like, Nearly every NBA team uh, optimizes around that. I think the same will happen in the NFL. Well, speaking to some, speaking to the NFL coaches that I've been fortunate enough to talk to, uh, you know, it's the risk aversion of losing a job, and I discussed that with you a little bit last night. You know, they know, they look at the numbers, and they know those numbers are accurate. But if I go for it and, and it's fourth and one in the first quarter, and I'm on my own 20 yard line, and I'm an NFL coach and I don't make it. You know, maybe I get fired if I'm in the eighth game of the season and I'm 500. But if I punt it and fired lose, anyway, though. I will. And ironically enough, that's the irony about it is it's <laughs> going to help them win more games. So, Bill, there's so many gimmicks in baseball that have been normalized. Sack bunt. I mean, it's, it's now in. You know, it's in the expanded box score. That was a gimmick. The knuckleball, a gimmick. Right. One reliever for the ninth inning. 
If you want a definition of a gimmick, MIT architecture. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, uh, a gimmick is simply an innovation that's so far ahead of its time that there's no real foundation built to know whether it's going to work or not. The, on the issue of football being analytical, I've heard people make the argument, and I tend to believe it, that actually football is very analytical, but that the analysis moved inside the franchises a long time ago, and it consists of backward-looking analysis, the, the study of the film from last, last week's game. I tend to think that that's true, and it may be, uh, I'm a Kansas City Chiefs fan, not a huge football fan, but we had a game late in the season. Uh, it, it wasn't a question of going for it on the 20-yard line. It was a question of going for it on your own 45. And I do understand why coaches are reluctant to go for it from their 20, but I do not understand not going for it fourth and three on the 40, on the 45. But to me, that's just totally baffling. And, and, and ironically enough, if you look at the numbers that I've seen, it, it's, it's human thinking is that you're actually better off going for it from your own 20 than you are between the 40s is the place that you should punt the most according to the numbers because of the field position, the change that when you're on your own 20 and you punt it, the net punt, they're going to score a high percentage of the time anyway from where you give them the ball. Whereas if you're between the 40s and you punt, they're going to score a lot lower percentage of the time. So it's actually a little bit contrary wow. to what, the, what you would commonly think. George, you coached in Europe. I did. Different game in terms of texture, a few rules, the trapezoid. Um, what did you learn about the nature of innovation? Are there cultural factors? Something about you know, the constitution of European basketball that's different from, say, the American character of <clears throat> basketball? I think the biggest characteristic of a pro NBA game and a European game is the eight-minute difference. You know, we, in Europe, they play 40-minute games, and, and the NBA is a 48-minute game. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is an incredible amount of time that those that in, in Europe, there's more upsets. There's more ability to control the game to where you'll win. A, a weaker team can be the talented team. Uh, in the NBA, that, that eight minutes, it's so hard to sustain a weaker team sustaining its advantages or its gimmicks or it's tricks, those eight minutes is incredibly, it's, it's powerful, I'm gonna tell you. In Europe, I was always, I coached a really good team, I coached Real Madrid, and you know, our, they asked me one time what, what your record was, and they, they would say seven. I said, what do you mean? Well, you've lost seven times. They didn't even count how many times you won, because you were supposed to win, and so. Uh, but the gimmick of, uh, I mean, that eight minutes is incredibly, in the NBA, it's so hard to sustain. I mean, so many times, you know, a, a bad team can have a lead going into the fourth quarter, and the other team turns up the heat for the first five minutes, game, game's over, they win by 10. And, and how long is the shot clock in Europe? It's now 24, but when I was there, it was 30 seconds. Right. So that, that emphasizes the, the shortness of the game because yeah. you're reducing the possessions, which helps the lesser team compete. Right. The thing about, you know, the, the NBA game of, you know, how, you know, I'm going to brag a little bit on, on the gimmick that we, we I was kind of, when I got fired last year, it was kind of like the gimmick was, you know, we play, our, our style works in the regular season, but it doesn't work in the playoffs. Well, you know, I don't think my team can beat anybody playing a slow down possession basketball game in the, in the playoffs or the regular season. So, you know, the, the style of playing fast and playing quicker, I think is going to get, get more contagious in the NBA. I think you're going to see more teams go to, you know, because I, there's great coaching in the NBA, and playing fast takes out concepts. It takes out the philosophies of the defense because it's a reactionary game. If you're scoring and trying to score in the first seven to ten seconds, it's a reactionary game. It's not a structured game. And, and I think, uh, you know, you, you, if you're going to try to play power basketball against the best big guys in the world and LeBron James and Kevin Durant in a seven-game series, they're going, to, they're going to figure out how to beat you. But I think philosophically you've got to change. And it, I, I've been called gimmicky my whole life. I, 
I coached in Seattle and we double teamed and rotated and trapped and all that, that works in the regular season, but it doesn't work in the playoffs. Because in the playoffs, teams have more time to prepare for you. They, they understand your systems better. And I think it's a bunch of baloney because, yeah, I mean, you know, your adjustment you make to me, I can make an adjustment again to counter your adjustment. So it's kind of, I think coaches, they try to be creative and innovative. Sometimes in the NBA, get crucified. Fortunately, I have won enough games that I can probably sustain keeping a job. A younger guy like, say, Brad Stevens here, you know, I think there's some things that work in college that could work in pro ball, but the guts to make it work, there's always the scrutiny and criticism. It doesn't, it's not successful in some form. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize that. That, that is the criticism of how Georgia's team play. I think gimmicky could be like, you just win a lot. <laughs> People are trying to criticize it in some way. Mike D'Antoni's team, they said that couldn't win a title. They made the Western Conference Finals twice, I believe. It's crazy. I mean, more, team, more teams don't win the championship playing traditional than playing in an advanced way. It's, it's really, uh, but when a team plays traditional and doesn't win, they don't go, oh, that doesn't work. Uh, so teams, for sure, we know that you know, getting, getting shots early in the clock is a good thing. For sure, we know that um, you know, being a team that's hard to anticipate by playing out of sets versus play calls is a good thing. We know a lot of things that are very good on offense, and just because you know necessarily a team hasn't been labeled as that team plays that way and hasn't won the title doesn't mean you can't win. It's going to happen, and as more teams play that way, it's for sure going to happen. Um, you know, you know how to get rid of that okay. that label? You can't win the postseason. David Ortiz. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about rule changes. If I want a law changed, you hire a lobbyist you write your congressman, 10 minute quarters. I think it's a great idea. Um, I happen to be a proponent of the four pointer. What is the process in a league for getting a rule change? I mean, there's a rule committee, but how do you, what, is, what is that legislative process like? Well, I mean, Commissioner Silver can talk about it in basketball. I mean, it really comes down to the owners. owners. So you just gotta get enough owners on board. I mean, there are a lot of committees that basketball folks are on, but they generally don't listen. I mean, it's just true. So, so, but if you get enough owners on board and it can help the overall business, if it's perceived to overall help the business, speed up the game, make it more interesting game, then I think you get enough people on board. Baseball decided in the 1950s that it was a perfect game and shouldn't innovate anymore. And this was a, it was a terrible thing. And baseball always had a rules committee, which up until the 30s actually worked to maintain the competitiveness of the game. I think college basketball does the greatest job of that. I think they, college basketball does a greater job of maintaining the competitiveness of their game than anybody else. But baseball did the worst job for a long time. And after the rules committee stopped doing anything substantive, then the players union, the players, and I don't object to this, the players acquired the right to approve rules changes. So then you had, then we ground to a complete halt. And it wasn't until the last 10 years that people have started to wake up and realize this perfect game stuff is going to kill us, and uh, the, uh, uh, we need to figure out how to make this work better. Well, what are the changes you'd want to see? The, uh, the, the main thing that needs to be addressed, and it is, there are serious efforts to address it, is the pace of the game. And I'm not talking about the length of the game, I'm talking about the game's being perceived as boring because the things that are happening are so subtle that uh, you have to play the game at least 20 years to be able to see them. When you say, when you, when you talk about making any game a better game, though it, it's always, the better game is made by the perception of who's making those rules. For instance, the NFL decided that they wanted to be a more offensive game. So they changed the rules and pass blocking a long time ago and what you could do to receivers and hands-on to make it a higher scoring game. I think their perception was better game is more fans, more money, more ratings, that kind of thing. And so I, I don't know that all rules from all across the sports are always designed to make it better for fans. It's truly to make it a better game. So I think there's a lot of uh, a good question about what makes something a better game personally. I think the NBA should go 
in the month of February, they should play an all-star game, and then they should have a single elimination NCAA basketball tournament. <laughs> and instead of playing 82 games, that you have two champions. You have the NCAA champion mentality, because a single elimination tournament is a totally different coaching philosophy than a seven-game series. A seven-game series, there's a, a lot of you know, counter, counterplay, counterpoint ad, attitude. But a single game elimination where, okay, I'm playing a team I'm not supposed to beat, and I can come out and play a box in one or a triangle in two and gimmick and upset somebody, which happens in the NCAA basketball, which is, I think, the more exciting. I, I mean, the Final Four is, probably other than the Super Bowl, is the most electric selling piece of basketball in the, in the country today. And, and I think if you did that, somehow got the NBA players to do that. And then take, you know, you could take, you could play the first round maybe on your home court and then get it to 16 teams and take that to San Diego and then get the final four and take that to Kansas City or something like that. And you, I think it would be just, uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to see. I don't know if the NBA players would buy into it, but I think as a coach, it is extremely different than a seven-game series versus a single elimination. They, they should buy into it because the TV money would be <coughs> mammoth. I mean, people tune in to watch a game on, for two reasons. What is how uncertain is the outcome? And two is how important is it to the final prize, the championship? And unfortunately, the NBA you know, fails on that measure maybe worse than any sport. A Tuesday, you know, Spurs versus whoever's the worst team in the league in the 82-game schedule, it's like a 96% chance the Spurs are going to win. It has almost no meaning to the final who's going to win the championship. And ideas like this, I think, are where we need to go. Uh, the seven-game series is, I think, really hurts the NBA. It's funny because the league has addressed parity, which is always stated as a goal. Um, I would argue that parity not, should not necessarily be a goal, but let's assume it is for the sake of the conversation. Um, yet it seems like if you really want to address parity, you introduce more randomness right. into the sort potential of, yeah. outcomes. Exactly, exactly. I agree with that. Is entertainment the sole goal here? I mean, Bill, you said something interesting, that uh, the pace of the game is going to kill baseball. And the suggestion is, is that a younger audience isn't going to take to a guy walking around on a mound, futzing with the rosin bag, whatever it is. Um, is entertainment the goal, or is fairness the goal in terms of designing a game that makes sense? Well... Entertainment is the ultimate goal, but you, we achieve that through the pathway of, of competitive, competitiveness uh, and, and sports. So if you, entertainment is not some singer, who, you know, some <laughs> musician singing the Star Spangled Banner and putting on a performance in the seventh inning. It's, I mean, it's, the entertainment is the competitiveness of the game. I'd love to see some... Uh some research, maybe there's some papers here about what's the optimal point. Because if you have a game that's totally random and there's like no skill involved, it's not exciting to fans. The NBA is the one sport, except maybe tennis, where the NBA champion, they really are the best team almost always. There might be some exceptions, right? But you don't get through four seven game series is and the regular is that a good season. Thing or a terrible thing? I argue it's a terrible thing. I kind of like it because you have these epic clashes between, you know, the Thunder and the Heat. Yeah. Or but, whatnot, but but you know the NFL, where it's it's pretty darn random, is you know by some margin the most successful sport commercially, I think. And, and but I I've, I argue that the biggest problem in the NFL, and you alluded to it, is you know who's going to win. I mean, it, but there's a really good chance my, when this is all over, Miami's on top. The uh, 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 I hope not. You can name two or three. <laughs> the uh, uh, but. Uh, so you're a fan of the wild card where an 86-win team can, you know, essentially get hot and, and find themselves with the world champion, even though we've already played 162. Well, the, uh, I, I have a couple of rings that I'm not giving back that were won by wild card teams, you know. So, yeah, I'm a big fan. I do like the idea. I mean, we're talking about uh, it's become so oriented toward who wins the championship, whereas you look at the football system in England and Europe, right? You have multiple competitions throughout the year. They're each meaningful um, in their own way, right? But, um, but how, do, how do the basketball guys react to the idea that the game is too predictable? Do you, do you, th do you think that's a, is that valid or is that like carping? 
I like it's predictable right now. Because uh, uh, you're winning. Team. <laughs> you have a good team, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, as a coach, you know, last year we went on a 15-game winning streak. Uh -huh. And... And when you're in that winning streak, you never think you're going to win. You're never going to lose. And then we went on a three-game losing streak. And then you never think you're ever going to win again. I mean, it, even though predictability and, and the power of winning has a way of building an arrogance and a confidence, it is helpful somewhat. But in the NBA, the best team and the worst team aren't that far apart. It's the little things of how, how to win a game. I mean... I mean, there are a lot of NBA teams that can stay in a game and then in the fourth quarter just don't know how to win a game. And, you know, you, know, you, you talk about team and winning, the analytics of winning and teamness, I think, and, 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 and the chemistry and character of a locker room, can we get analytics in these areas as a coach? We're more, probably more interested in the in the intangibles, the, the little things that we know as coaches the, that, be, be, that, that build a belief and a trust in each other through, through success. Uh, the chemistry and connection of a basketball team. You know, we, there's statistics to help us coaches figure out the plus minuses and who plays well together and who's your best defensive team and who's your best offensive team. We, we, we like all that, but there's a, there's a, a chemistry and an energy that comes with the word I use is teamness. That I wish is, is there an analytical solution that help, a help here? And it's a combination of probably stats and performance, but it's also a combination of clutch performance, good, good decision making at the end of a game, intelligent when the foul and not the foul, uh, and stuff. All that stuff is, I mean, I mean, so much of what I would like to see analytics become in basketball is on the outside, just not stats of the numbers, because so much of the numbers now, I think, is building your team. Is, you know, it's building with the salary cap and how to spend money on what, to, what position to spend money, what type of player to spend money on. As a coach, we just want to have a chance to build a good team and hopefully take that good team and grow into a really good team and then I mean, the momentum of what's going to happen in the Western Conference this year with Daryl's team, and there's, there's, a, there's going to be a team that's going to grow up this playoff season. Someone's going to grow up. Is it going to be the Clippers? Is it going to be Houston? You know, some people thought it was going to be Golden State. Last year, Memphis kind of grew up, and they threw it out. I think they threw it out the water with fire and their coach. Coach Cook, John Hollinger out there, come see me. But, uh, but I mean, it, it, there's, there's, there's a connection and a chemistry to – to team basketball um, Bill, that you can feel. You said the best team wins the NBA championship. I believe that. The most talented team doesn't, I think, very seldom wins the NBA championship. Bill, in your 83 abstract, you have this great comment about Enos Cabell. And you just rip Sparky Anderson saying he, he buys this stuff too much, that, there, that we ball players are overrated, the team guys. This is an abstraction that can't be quantified in playing guys who don't produce, but because you perceive them to be good culture or locker room guys, is bunk. And uh, you, you were pretty strong about it. Do you still buy it? I don't think so. Not, not the way you phrased it. The, uh, um, I don't in any way, shape, or form diminish the importance of having a workable chemistry. I, it's, simply, it's not that it's not true. It's not that it's not profoundly true. It's simply beyond, it's, it's so true you can't study it. It's beyond your reach of your capacity to study it. Not that we won't ever get there, but that we're a long way away from it. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, uh, but I don't in any, any sense now, maybe I did when I was young and knew everything, I don't in any sense now question that that's valid. I mean, if you look at any type of business, I think some businesses are a lot better than others at getting employees to perform at their best. Um, the one counter that in sports is that if you have individual statistics, like you know, I have writers, for example, that I manage, and we can look at their page count or whatever, maybe not the best metric. Um, in the NBA or MLB, you can kind of measure everything, so maybe guys are more incentivized to perform. But the challenge in, in basketball in particular is that the selfish incentives sometimes conflict the team <laughs> incentives, right? Everyone would want to attempt more shots and get their, um, get their points per game up 
and so forth. And you have to figure out how to cooperate and manage those possessions. Um, there's a lot of evidence in the NBA that you take a player from one environment, put him in another, and all of a sudden his performance changes fairly drastically, at least as measured by um, the major analytics. Less true in, in baseball, but basketball, that is a, a, big, uh, a big constraint. And, but one more thing is that sometimes teams also use this as an excuse to say, well, yeah, it's hard to measure this stuff, but that doesn't mean that any ad hoc arbitrary decision you make is a good one. Some stuff's just tricky, um, and you need both analytics and a good organizational culture, I think, to, to find success. I think it's, I think it's hard, it'd be hard to quantify, but there's a direct correlation between two things, probably in all sports. The higher the talent level, the more mistakes you can make as a team. But also, I would say the better the team chemistry, probably the more mistakes you can make, not only in a game as a team, but maybe even uh, in, in personnel-wise, as long as you've got a, like, and I think the New England Patriots are a great example of that. I mean, they seem, no matter who they bring in, they've got enough chemistry to when they bring that outside guy in that they, they function as a team. You know, you look and they had more free agents playing this year than anybody. They lose two of the best tight ends in the league, and they're still able to go to the semifinals of the, of the NFL. And I, I think that's a, that's a contribution to what their team is. They're, it's inversely proportional to the number of mistakes they can make. You sent a really interesting email. You said that in looking at fourth down data, you asked academics to factor in emotion to the data. And they said, nah, this isn't something that's quantifiable. What did you mean? What I meant was, when I, when I looked at the data and first start, when I first started looking at it, um, and then we started applying it to what we were doing, I had t tons of economists and guys that were do doing this call and want, want information, what, how it's working, that kind of thing. They look at yard, points per yard line and things like that, and now they factored in some more things. But to give you an example, what they want, I, I said, let's factor in the psychology of the game of football. It's an emotional game and things happen. And you hear about some of those things and you don't know if they're true. Like, you know, when, when a team gets a turnover, they go for the kill play right afterwards. Well, here's, here's something that might measure, that show, show it a little bit. For instance, in the data I had over years of college football, and this is at every level, that teams scored a touchdown for a while 20%, or 17% of the time when they acquired the ball on the 20 yard line, okay? Via a punt or a kickoff, they scored 17% of the time. But when they, they acquired the ball in the same spot via a turnover, a fumble interception, that number went to 33%. Now this is over thousands of thousands of, of situations, so I think that's enough sample to make, you know, a 17 to 33% shows that emotion is, is in there. That team was moving the ball. They got down to the 20, they turned it over. Their defense has to trot out there. They were ready for a score, they didn't get one. Psychologically, they're down. And then I started looking at what we did over an 11 year period, and it's just one team, so it's really not enough data. But we score a touchdown 49% of the time over the last 11 years that we get the ball, regardless of however it is. When we convert a fourth down, we score a touchdown on that drive 76% of the time. And 50% of the time, we score within the next three plays outside the 40-yard line after, after we make a fourth down. That's psychology. And George, you said something earlier. You, um, the idea that one of the reasons you deploy unpredictability and sort of guerrilla warfare was it can demoralize the opponent in, in a way that you know, just scoring on them in a set offense may not be able to. I don't like to be predictable. I like to be unpredictable as a coach. I like, I like, you know, I like to throw things at my opponent and see how they're going to react. I like to be the creative team, the versatile team. Uh, but the emotion thing I'd like to get to a little bit because I really think, I don't know, I, I've never, I'm, this would be a stat I think someone would like to do is a momentum swing in the, in the, in the fourth quarter at the, between the 12 minute mark and the seven minute mark. I now, when I was coaching, I always wanted to dominate that period of time. I wanted to dominate with energy and, and emotion and take control of the momentum of, of both scoring and emotion at that point in the game. And I rotated my best team to, to go at that game, especially on the home court, especially on the, our home court. We were 38-3 and three at home court, and our game plan was at the end of the third quarter and the first four minutes of the fourth quarter is to try to punch that team. And I really felt, you know, the game in the NBA, you know, you, you punch them in the first five minutes of a game. I mean, teams get up 26 to 7, and, and they come back. But in the, when fatigue starts setting in and there's only eight, five to eight minutes left in the game, I want to be in control of the emotion part, the, 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 the momentum part of the game, if I can be. Darrell, what's been the hardest innovation to sell to your coaching staff? 
Well, I think <clears throat> I'd probably say uh, there's a, and George is good on this, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's the loss of control. I mean, I think if you go to Europe, um, again, they're shorter games. They're more like football games. It's like a called play, run it. College basketball is like this, too. A lot of, a lot of set plays. There's a lot of control. There's a lot of trying to instrument the game. And I think uh, for a lot of coaches, um, and ours are great, but I'd say for a lot of coaches, you know, giving up that control, like, um, I'll give an example. Uh, Dwight Howard, you know, does a, does a very good job in, uh, you know, in his scoring, his scoring touches. Um, but when he was with Orlando and Stan Van Gundy, those were more instrumented. There were play calls. He sort of knew when he was going to get the ball. The way we play, Dwight doesn't often know when he's going to get the ball, where he's going to get the ball. And that's one of the reasons we're very hard to guard and we're top five in offense right now. Uh, but when you talk to the coaches, you talk to the players, sometimes that can be hard when Dwight's saying, okay, I'm rolling, you know, I want to get a touch here, but now I've got, you know, the ninth guy on my roster shooting. You know, that didn't happen when I was, you know, when I was in Orlando, I knew I was going to get the ball. Whereas here, I'm going to get it at different times, but I'm not sure when. That's, that's, that's been a tough, uh, transition. I'd say a little bit more for the players than the coaches. But it's a really interesting point, I think, that, that coaches tend to be control freaks, right? I mean, coaches want to tend to want to control the action uh, on on the floor to the maximum. And in all sports, I think all coaches overuse strategies which give them the illusion of control. And that's one reason that people punt when they shouldn't shouldn't be punting is it gives them the illusion of control of the action. But but. Uh, Chaos, when, but chaos is actually very useful. Uh, if you if you are on offense and you can create chaos, it will lead to a breakdown and you can and you can score. So the the instinct to try to control the flow of the action actually can work against you. And I I, I think that that is one of the things that makes great coaches is that in basketball more than any other sport is that tolerance for creating chaos on the floor. I have a story on that. When I first came to the Rockets, uh, Jeff Van Gundy, who's a great coach, was there. We started tracking all his play calls for him, and he's great at using data, very smart. Uh, and, you know, by the end, you know, maybe two-thirds of the way through, we had enough data to say, okay, which play calls maybe were better than most. And I was looking at it, and, and I was like, okay, you know, we've got horns, we've got this. I was like, well, what's, what's this one? at the top, the most, the most efficient one. And he's like, it was called random. <laughs> and he was, he was like, he, he was like, oh, that's when the play breaks down and we just set a random screen. And I was like, that might tell us something right there. That was like, our best play is random, <laughs> so. The game of basketball is a game of, of, of execution, spacing, offensive, offensive basketball is a game of execution, spacing, and decisions. And I think the quicker decisions, the game is going to go to players who can make good, quick decisions. Uh, and the slow game of execution and, and, more, and, and, and some spacing, but I mean, the teams that run all these plays and go, go from one side of the court and, and shoot late in the shot clock, I think it's gonna, it's been, statistically, it's just not an efficient offense unless you're a great defensive team. And I just think the game is going to no position basketball players, quick decision basketball players, and smart decision makers. And you know, I kind of, I fell into this. I'll be honest, I'll, I'll tell you how I fell into this was, we made the mellow trade. In the mellow trade, we got Raymond Felton. Raymond Felton comes to our team, and he's our second best guard. Maybe, maybe our, you know, he's good. But Ty Lawson's my guy. So Ty, Ty Lawson, I say to you, Raymond, Ty's, I'm going to start Ty. I know you want to start, but I'm going to start Ty. And within a week, you know, we knew Raymond wasn't going to be there after the season. But I started playing them together. And it wasn't because I, th I was this guy that said, I'm smart. I just said, well, I'm going to play my best players. All right, well, well, putting two point guards on the court is now becoming a fad in the NBA. 
And I didn't think it other than the trade made me do it. And now I believe that you want an Andre Iguodala on your team because he can play like a point guard at 6'8", and he can play 1, 2, 3, or 4. And you want, well, you want however you call him, a stretch 4, but you want a stretch 4 that makes good, quick decisions. And that, that's why it's effective. It's not that we want to play with midgets on the court. We want quick decisions and effective decisions because the pace of the game, when you slow it down, it's not an efficient game. When you play five on five and the defense has concepts and philosophies and good coaching and well-drilled players, it's not an efficient game. You want to get into that random area, that, that random area, and who's going to be best in the random area? The great athlete's going to be good there, but he's got to make good decisions and he's got to understand spacing and probably less execution. Well, I'd say our owner, Leslie Alexander, put me on this when I first was there. We had Tracy McGrady and Yao Bank, so it was tough to play this way. But he said, look, the, the, deep, the, deep, the Tom Thibodeau, Jeff Van Gundy defenses are just too well designed. You can't beat them, especially with the new defensive three-second rules. You can't beat them just going against them half court, slow it down. You're, just, you're, you're throwing yourself against the wall. You've got to get, get something early before they can set. So. To, uh, and, and Coach Carl and I were talking before, and to kind of bring football back into this, we're the slowest ones to adapt. You said something to me that, that really made me think this just now, and that was he said, you know, in the NBA, coaches can't be the dominant star of the team because you, a lot of times you have stars in the NBA. Well, in the NFL, I think maybe, and in college and in high school, I think our egos may be a little bigger and it's okay for us to be the star. So we're a little less reluctant to have analytics play in simply because we want everybody to think it's us as being a good coach. When ironically enough, if we brought analytics in, we'd be better coaches. But that goes into, you know, Bill said something earlier too about we, we, we use past things in analytics. You know, we, we look at tendencies and formations. Now we are trying to predict, but another thing y'all are talking about as far as fast pace, you take a team like Auburn and they're playing a team like Alabama, we know, they know they can't beat Alabama but they know that if we can go fast enough, Alabama can't use the analytics of predictability of what Auburn's doing formation-wise if they speed that game up. And I think Oklahoma showed that in the, in the Sugar Bowl as well. So co football coaches not being, uh, or being a little ego-driven, I think, is what's slowing us down. Uh, Going to go for questions now. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. They are on this iPad. I get to choose them. <laughs> All right, this one is for Daryl, only because it's a pet issue of mine. Um, is there a way to eliminate the constant free throws and fouls at the end of close games, or are we going to need a rule change? Huh. Uh, I, th I think, again, we have a good, good tradition in basketball of making changes. I think an easy one with free throws is just to have one free throw worth two points. I know you guys have looked at this in some of your hoop idea things. So I think that's, a, that's an easy change, you know, just off the top of my head, that would speed things up. Uh, you, you can go more radical than that as well, I think. George. Uh, you know. <laughs> or is that something you value? Free throw shooting is an extreme high valued athletic skill in our game. Making free throws uh, is, is, an at, is a huge talent. But as a fan, do I want to watch it? Uh, you know, a missed free throw. I think I think that is it brings some emotion to the game, you know, the choke factor, the you know, it, it there's something about uh, the strategy of an NBA game at the end is very very everybody can kind of coach it, but in the same sense the guys that know how to win doing it are usually the guys that make free throws and also make get extra possessions. The one under most underrated great basketball play in a, in the last 2 minutes of a basketball game is an offensive rebound. You win. There's so many games won in the NBA because of an offensive rebound, which gives that team an extra possession. Or sometimes, I mean, you can win a game. If you're up three and it's a minute to go in the game and you get an offensive rebound, the game's over. As where if you don't get that offensive rebound. And, and no one ever accentuates, you know, the offensive rebound in, in late game situations. I don't think play, teams execute 
that much better at the end of games. I mean, I mean, the statistics say it's a very small. The best team in the, in the last, last two minutes of the game is not that much better than the worst team. It's the extra possession, the smart play, the, non, the, guy, the team that doesn't foul when, he, when another team does foul. What is it about proposed innovations that drive fans crazy? You want that one, Bill? Uh, good question. Uh, and I think it relates to that perception that we have a perfect game and we shouldn't be messing with it. The uh, people still upset about the DH rule. It's been 41 <laughs> years, you'd think people would be used to it. But, uh. Uh, Nate, you've seen it across. Uh, I mean, people really objected. Actually, your fellow folks in the media objected when you decided that narrative doesn't really matter, or it matters not a, a lot, but it's actually just the fundamentals of the demographics and whatnot, people went crazy. Yeah, you know, my bias is think that shit flows downhill, right? So I think, you know, certainly in um, some forms of journalism, the media underestimate how smart their audience actually is if you're in the process of, of educating them, for lack of a better term, um, talking to them as peers, um, you know. So I think likewise in sports, sometimes it's kind of the, the sports local uh, radio hosts and columnists who are more inclined to say, this is a change that the game's always been played, whereas, whereas fans you know, might appreciate, for example, in baseball, have a pitch clock or something, right? Um, I think it would make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but, but I think it would be more the uh, kind of media personalities who would be more inclined to object to it. Uh, Nate, agree or disagree? 80% of political analysis is childish nonsense. Oh, sure, yeah, that <laughs> might be low. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one's for Kevin. Uh, you have punted only a handful of times over the last decade. What were those situations, and why did you buck your own trend? Um, you know, I, I don't have, the, it, there's a little bit of a, a farce of what my beliefs are. I'm, I would like to optimize what we do exactly, but in high school, there's not enough numbers. The game's a little bit different, um, but the times I have is when there's no reward for the risk. For instance, if you're, you know, back in 2011, I probably shouldn't have punted that year at all. We punted once. And that was, well, we were on our own 10-yard line or somewhere in there, and there's 15 seconds left in the half. So even if and it was fourth down, so even if we make the first down, we're not going to score a touchdown. So there's no reward at the end of it. If there's no reward, then, then we're not going to do that. And there are some times when we shouldn't punt, or when we should punt that we do, but I don't have the numbers. If I was in the NFL and they've got that NFL bot that has that chart, I'm telling you, you go exactly by that. It's the casino theory. You know, every little advantage, every little game-winning decision you make, every little decision you make gives you an either plus 0.3% or 1.2% chance of winning, or it lowers it off every decision. There's guys that run these numbers that are geniuses, that are unbiased, and if they tell me that's the best optimal level to do it, that's what I would do. We're still at a point where we're fouling up three, and the data often supports it. What's going on there? It's not happening. Coaches don't want it. Coaches, all, all coaches I've ever talked to say you got to foul the three, and nobody teaches it or feels comfortable doing it. I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 what, I'm there. How many times I've gone in, uh, do you want to follow the three? And the players go, oh, I know, coach, let's just play. And the stats say you should follow the three. Because no one wants to be the guy that fouls in, in well, Chris Paul and there, one the, of these. The, yeah, the trick okay. of getting that shot and giving up free three throws where you look like just a stupid basketball team when you do it. So. It's, it's uh, actually interesting. The stats are somewhat inconclusive if you look back. If you look in the rearview mirror, uh, team, you win almost always either way. Like you win at such a high rate, and they're within a tolerance that you couldn't say one's better than the other. But I, fouling up three is definitely better as long as the team, as long as you've worked on it and you know how to do it, and you know if you're against Kobe, he's going to try and go up quick. Um, you know, as soon as they inbound it to a bad free throw shooter, you know, hit him immediately. So, uh, I, to George's point, yeah, players don't like to do it. That's part of it. Um, and, uh, and coaches don't have time to practice it. I mean, yeah, and appropriately. You know, it's something you probably have to practice more than we, and why would you be practicing this? But we probably should practice it more. Well, here's a question for you as a player. He said if you ask the players they don't want to, is there any possibility the reason they don't want to amongst what you said because they know that one of us is also going to have to shoot free throws immediately afterwards, and we don't want to do that? No, I think it's a couple things. One is... Coaches often want to show confidence in their defense, so that, that's real. I think that's true. Um, so that's a, that's a factor that I've heard against it. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, again, 
you know, that you look really bad if you follow guys shooting on a three-pointer. So I think if you if you play solid, what everyone else does, and they make a three, sometimes people go, oh well, and they even though you should probably criticize more. Um, I like this one. Do North American sports need more negative incentives, such as the relegation systems in European uh, leagues, to stimulate innovation and entertainment? I mean, the irony is that American sports are really socialist, basically, and European sports are really kind of aggressively capitalist survival of the fittest. Um, you know, I think it'd be interesting and fun, but the problem is you can't set up a relegation system without changing the whole structure of the leagues in general. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I think uh, European soccer is an interesting test in that it's a case where the first generation of analytics didn't tell you very much at all. There aren't that many stats, but now that you're getting um, much more data on how the ball is moving about the feel of the course of the match, um, you know, you're starting to measure tackles and passes and not just goals and bookings um, to see how many innovations are adopted in, in the Premier League, the other major leagues of Europe will be, I think, an interesting test case. They, oh, go ahead. I, uh, Is he talk, when you say that you're talking about in soccer, uh, in, in European countries they win, they get to move up into the different leagues. You know, you, the first thing that popped in my head when you said that, the NFL is so, so monetary driven as far as rules and this and that. I don't think there's not enough teams where you can move them up and down the league, but what if you don't win so many games or you finish last in the league, we find that team and find each individual player. Now, they'll never do that, but if we're truly a monetary incentive you know, organization, you, you that might be something. Bad bad ratings and things like that. Right. So I, I would say it'll never happen in, in North American sport. You know, no one's going to buy a franchise for one to two billion and they get relegated it's worth 200 million. And but you could do it in college. I think so. You yeah. could do it in college where you have Your division the, the division, you the best division of, and then you get to college football and the same thing. That, that yeah. be, I, I, think, I think Alabama should be made an NFL team. <laughs> 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 what about the incentive structure, let's say in the NBA? Is there enough, I would say punishment, but is there neg enough negative incentives so that teams, uh, we see the draft, and this is one of my pet hoop ideas. I, I just think it's a terrible Yeah, I mean, the incentive. best asset gets handed to the worst teams. It's, it's, it's a terrible structure, and you could, you could either take some of the more advanced uh, you know, draft change ideas like uh, you know, Mike Zarin at the Celtics, or just a simple one, go back to a straight Lottery. I think we, we have to get rid of the marginal incentive to, to lose in uh, some way. And there's a lot of innovative ideas, but we just need to pick the best idea among the best ones. And because it, it's, it's bad right now, I think last year at the end of the season, I counted like two thirds of the teams weren't trying to win their games at the end of the year. Uh, for Bill James, are there any recent developments in sabermetrics that particularly intrigue you with their potential? that merit a closer look? Uh, I, I think that, that's almost exactly the same question to which I gave the answer about the next big thing is looking at how leagues are structured and rules are structured. I think the next area where we'll make an impact is, is not any of this data-driven stuff. It's trying to understand the vast gap between potential and performance. Uh, I think that the next thing where we really have a chance to change how decisions are made is if we can, if we can, if you can get 51% accurate in saying this is the guy who's going to have a good year and this is the guy who's not, I think there's tremendous advantage in that. And I, I would bet that's where it goes. Yeah, people talk about scouting and development. Um, a lot of the research so far has been on the scouting side. In essence, how do you use analytics to help that process? But the development side, I think, is, is really important. Uh, and you seem to see, at least in baseball, difference between teams like the, the Cardinals seem to get guys who have maybe checkered past and they perform at their best, right? There's some organizational capacity there. You know, way back before, kind of the Moneyball era, the Atlanta Braves always seem to have a way to have guys feel like, if I fly my best, I'm going to be rewarded with the position in the starting lineup. Um, so the development side, I think, needs to be thought through a lot more, including keeping guys healthy, I think, is, is part of that. Daryl, health analytics, biology? Well, I think there's obviously 
issues with that in terms of, uh, you know, I know Mark Cuban's been on, you know, DNA, things like that. I think, I think it's coming, but it's something that will be collectively bargained, probably. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Hmm? Nobody told us what to do when it was over. So we <laughs>